Good morning, friends, and greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we, friends, will rejoice and be glad in it. Because of that question that began today's service, is God a forever thing? And friends, know today that the answer is absolutely, unequivocally, yes. That God is a forever presence in each one of our hearts and lives. That God is present among us always, loving us, forgiving us, and welcoming us home. Because friends, we have been created in the image of God. We have been created with the name of God written upon our hearts and our lives. And friends, that is good news. No matter who we are or where we may have come from today, may you be reminded, may you hear and believe that you are a child of God. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. You are a servant of the Holy Spirit, loved, forgiven, and welcome home in the arms of God. Friends, on behalf of the people and the ministry of the Old First Presbyterian Church in Huntington, New York, I welcome each and every one of you into this time and this space to worship God in spirit and in truth. And I encourage you to take a step forward in faith, deeper into relationship with God and Jesus Christ, beginning right now here today with this time of worship. Because friends, trust me, no matter where you have been, No matter what it is that brought you to this moment today, whether you feel like your life is crumbling around you or you feel like you are living on top of the world, no matter who you are, God welcomes you. God writes God's own name upon your heart and there is no other person in your life who will love you and welcome you home the way God will. And it begins now, today, here, friends, in our worship. So friends, let us bring that faithful confidence before our God, knowing that no matter who we are, God stands with arms wide open to welcome us home. And friends, it begins today with our call to worship from the 63rd Psalm. O God, you are my God. My soul thirsts for you, and my flesh cries out for your eternal presence. We gather before you in your sanctuary to witness your power, glory, and majesty. O God, your steadfast love is better than life itself. My heart and voice join together to praise your name. We will bless you as long as we live. We will lift our hands and call upon your name. In God alone are our souls satisfied. In God's presence alone does our mouth rejoice with praise. We gather in the shadow of your wings to sing for joy, for you have been our help. Friends in Christ, upheld by the unconditional love and eternal grace of the Lord our God, may we join in this celebration of knowing that God waits for us with open arms to welcome us home in this time of worship and every moment of our lives by lifting our hearts and voices in joyful and joy-filled praise as we sing today's opening hymn, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say.
Friends, today's first reading is from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. And in this particular moment in Scripture, we are reminded of very familiar words. This reminder from Paul that in Jesus Christ, we are indeed new creations. And friends, I invite us as we hear these words together to think in our hearts and in our minds of all those things in our lives, all those qualities, all those mistakes, all that guilt and shame that we so often put upon ourselves and we bring to worship and we bring to our experience of God's Word that we think makes us unworthy of God's love. And friends, as we think about those things that we put upon ourselves, may we hear this freedom in Jesus Christ, this invitation to be made new creations. And think, friends, about what it says about our God. That no matter who we are or how we have fallen short, in Jesus Christ, we are made new creations. Friends, may we hear the gift of this promise together from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, friends, as we continue to worship God together, I invite all of our young disciples who are worshiping with us today to gather closer to their screens. And friends, as we think about this invitation to receive the gift of ourselves as new creations, I want us to think together, young disciples, about what that means for us, both for the mistakes that we have made and for our desire to be together as a people of faith, longing to know the love and the new creation in Jesus Christ. A very special good morning and welcome to all of our wonderful young disciples worshiping with us today. Now friends, today we get to talk about one of the absolute best promises that God makes us in all of Scripture. And I hope by the time we're finished talking that you agree, young disciples, that this is an incredible promise. Because friends, if you are anything like me, then I'm guessing your lives are not perfect. Even though some of us would like to think so, none of us is perfect. Right, friends? And in fact, some days we know especially true that we are not perfect because we just have really, really bad days. Sometimes they call that getting up on the wrong side of the bed, right? 
There are days where nothing seems to go right, where every decision we make is the wrong decision. Everything that we say, everything that we do gets us into more trouble, and we start to feel like we can do nothing right in this world. Friends, those are the moments when this incredible promise we are talking about today needs to be at the front of our hearts and our minds. Because if you just heard those words we shared from Corinthians, friends, we are told that in Jesus Christ, we are made new creations. And friends, what that means is that the old things, the old ways of thinking, the old ways of doing things are all gone. Because when we give our hearts, when we give our lives to Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. The old is gone and a new creation has come. And what that means, friends, is that we have a chance to start over. And that means that no matter how bad our days are and no matter how bad our choices feel and no matter how far we feel like we've gone down the path that we just shouldn't have gone down, Jesus says to us that if we have hope and faith and trust and belief in him, that the old is gone and the new is come, we are made new creations, young disciples. In just a few minutes, we're going to read a parable that Jesus shared about two brothers. And you'll hear, friends, how one of the brothers made really bad choices with his life and the other brother made better choices, but still both of them came to a place where they just didn't feel like they had a place in their father's house. One because he had a lot of resentment and the other one because he had done some things that he just thought made him unworthy to be welcome. And friends, I want you to listen for how the father responds to both of his sons. And friends, without ruining the end of the story, let me tell you that he welcomes both of them home. That he opens his arms and hugs them and loves them and forgives them and says, you are always part of my family no matter what you feel, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, you are welcome home in my family love. And friends, that is how God responds to every single one of us. So friends, I want you to talk with your families this week. And I want you to remember this conversation for the rest of your lives, that no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter what choices you make, you are always loved and welcome home in the arms of God. There is nothing you can do that will make God stop loving you and forgiving you and making you a new creation and welcoming you home. And friends, that is how we are called to live with one another as examples of that love in our lives, in our world, and in Christ's church. So friends, can we thank God together for that wonderful promise as we bow together in prayer. Dear God, we give you thanks that you are our God and that you welcome us home in the arms of your love, no matter who we are or what we have done, making us new creations in Jesus Christ. We pray in his name, as together young disciples, all of God's people say, amen. Now, young disciples, I want you to listen very carefully now for this second reading from the Gospel of Luke. And I want you to remember that there are two brothers, one that made bad choices, one that stayed close to home, but both of them who shared one father who welcomed them and who welcomes every one of you and us, friends, home in the arms of God's love.
Friends, today's second reading comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. And here in this moment in the life and ministry of our Christ, we find Jesus teaching in a way that he so often taught his disciples and teaches us still today, friends, through the gift of parables. Now, if you are reading along at home and you have your Bibles open, then chances are pretty good, friends, that this section of Scripture is titled one of two ways. Either one as the parable of the prodigal son, or, friends, you may find that it is titled the prodigal son and his brother. And that is our temptation, right, friends? We read this parable, we think about this parable, we preach this parable, and we think about those two brothers and how each one of them represents us in different ways. And while that is certainly true, and we will certainly spend some time thinking about this parable in that way, friends, I want us to remember as we share this reading from Luke's Gospel that there is not one, there is not two, but three main characters in this parable. And while it is important for us to learn, yes, from both of these brothers, I invite us to listen and watch for that third character, the Father, and see what we may learn about our God in how He responds to both of His sons. Friends, let us listen together from the Gospel of Luke. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. 
Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. Because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life, he was lost and has been found. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to our God. Friends, in today's reading from the Gospel of Luke, once again Jesus finds himself in trouble for the kind of people that he is choosing to spend his time with, criticized by the religious leadership of his day for allowing those people, you know, friends, sinners, to gather around him to listen for and to hear his gospel message of unconditional love, unparalleled forgiveness, and radical welcome. And rather than take their bait, Jesus instead does what He has done time and time again. He teaches them and us, friends, through a parable. He tells a story about two young men who think they have their lives figured out. Two young men who, each one in their own way, have chosen a path that separates them not only from one another, but from their father who never stops loving them throughout the story no matter what. Now friends, if you read this morning's Scripture in your Bibles at home, the chances are pretty good that it is titled in one of two ways. Either the parable of the prodigal son, or it will be called the parable of the prodigal and his brother. As if, friends, these two young men are the only characters in this familiar story. But just for a moment, let's pretend that they are. Let's consider these two young men, the prodigal son and his brother, and think, friends, that if surely they are the main characters in this story, then one of them must provide the example that we as God's people today are supposed to follow. And we ought to be able to learn something about our faith and our lives from at least one of these two brothers. One who knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was better out there on his own, living life on his own terms, guided by his own vision, headstrong and independent. This is the brother who lived in the moment. The one who wanted to have it all, know it all, knowing in his head that life in his father's house was good, but believing in his heart that the grass was definitely greener on the other side. Two brothers, friends. The other who knew his duty was at home, close to his father, working the field, caring for the land, being the good and faithful child who did his part to make sure the family home was better with him than without. He was the faithful, dependable, and obedient brother, the one who recognized the security and safety of home, knowing that there might indeed be something that felt better beyond those walls, but believing in his heart that home with his father was where he was called to be. Two brothers, friends, as we've always interpreted them, one selfish, irresponsible, and reckless, the other faithful, dependable, and obedient. Two brothers. One who went out and spent everything he had ever been given. Living it up. You name it, he had it. All the toys, all the fun, all the bells and whistles of life. Everything you could imagine until suddenly it was gone. And his heart grew heavy with regrets. When it turned out that the grass wasn't actually greener on the other side and the shadows of pain and regret and guilt weighed his 
heart down. Two brothers, the other who never left his father, the one who had access to all of the riches the father longed to shower upon him, but never took the time to savor them because he had to keep going. He had to keep working, to keep toiling away, oblivious to what he was missing right there in front of him under his nose every day until the bitter shadows of jealousy, anger, and resentment weighed his heart down. Two brothers, one who lived his life close to home and the other who lived far from it. Two brothers, each one who's chose their own path, but both whose path ended far from where they thought they would be. Two brothers who, friends, reflect the lives we continue to live today. Some choosing to stay close to the heart of God. Choosing to live right here within the familiar home of the life and ministry of Christ's church. Here among God's great family of faith where we have access to the eternal riches of God that God longs to shower upon God's people. And yet far too often, friends, we fail to cherish the moment, the blessing of being here in the family of faith. And others still today, friends, who remain convinced that there is just not enough fun and excitement here in the family of God to satisfy our heart's desires. So we are constantly out there looking for the next great thing to fill our hearts, the next great thing to satisfy our needs, to gratify that hunger in our spirits, chasing that elusive high with whatever addiction fills our hearts for the moment, knowing that what is here today may in fact, or will in fact, be gone tomorrow. But still, friends, holding out that hope and belief that there is always something better out there just around the corner. We know people like this today, friends, because these two brothers represent the best of us and the worst of us. Two brothers who allow us to see in each one of their mindsets some reflection of ourselves. Two brothers who echo what it means for us to live our lives in the family of faith. Two brothers. And yet, friends, neither one of them may actually be the main characters in their own parable after all. Think about this for a moment, friends. Is this a parable that ultimately is about seeing ourselves reflected in either one or both of these brothers? Are we, as God's people today, supposed to identify exclusively with one of these two young men and then spend our entire lives trying to live into whatever lesson it is that we learn from them? Maybe that lesson is to be content with what we have been given by God. To not demand more. To not believe that we can go out and do better on our own than we can with God. Only to end up with our tails between our legs. Returning home to God with shame and disgrace. Or maybe we are supposed to learn to be happy with what we have been given by God to never long for something more, to never push those boundaries, to seek out moments of joy, even if they are fleeting, to simply keep our heads down, don't worry about what anyone else is doing, and just do what God has called us to do, only to end up jealous and bitter, wrapped up in those feelings that we somehow deserve something better from God that God has not given to us yet. Or, friends, if it doesn't have to be one or the other, is there something else going on in this parable? Is there someone else that we have neglected to notice? What if, friends, what if this isn't a parable about a prodigal son? What if this isn't a parable about a prodigal son 
and his brother. What if, friends, this parable is not about these two brothers at all, but about the one father that they share? One father who gives not one but both sons exactly what they ask for, exactly what they think they need, precisely what they want from him from the very beginning of this parable without question or hesitation or pause. One father who remains present with one son throughout the parable while also going out each and every day to look for and search for and wait for and long for the return of the other who has gone his own way. One father who runs with joy to embrace the son who returns home, but who in that same spirit of joy embraces the son who never left. Is Jesus presenting us, friends, with two brothers? One to warn us about living our lives with prideful arrogance, chasing temporary joy that is here today and gone tomorrow, believing we can do better on our own outside the family of faith, and this other brother to remind us what it is we are leaving behind. The joy of being part of God's great family of faith. Everything we need, everything we want, everything our hearts long for right here for the asking. Or, friends, or is Jesus showing us not two brothers, but one Father who loves us all more than words can ever say? The one who forgives us no matter who we are, where we have been, or what choices we have made. One who longs to give us our heart's deepest desires. And when those desires lead us down paths we know we should not be walking. One Father, one God who watches, waits, and runs to meet us. Not with judgment and condemnation, but with love, joy, forgiveness, and grace. Two brothers, friends both of whom learned they were selfish and wrong. One who realized that his way was not the better way, that no amount of shame and guilt would ever prevent him from returning to his father, and the other who also realized that his way was not the better way. That everything he longed for was already right there for him to experience if only he would open his eyes to see. And that no amount of resentment and jealousy would prevent him from being welcomed and celebrated by his father who loved him as well. Two brothers, friends. And if that's all there is, which one is the prodigal child. Or maybe, friends, it's not about two brothers after all, but one father, who even when we turn our backs on the family of God, is out there searching for us, waiting for our return, with arms open wide, with forgiveness and love, ready, willing, and able to celebrate our restoration with total and complete joy in his heart. One Father, who even when we live our entire lives safely and securely within the family of God, and yet become resentful and jealous over time for those whose return is celebrated, is right there beside us waiting for our return with arms open wide with forgiveness, love, and grace, ready, willing, and able to celebrate our restoration with total and complete joy in God's heart. Two brothers, friends. One who set off to find his own way and the other who never left. Two brothers, both of whom learned from experience that they share one Father whose love knows no boundaries, whose forgiveness restores life, and whose grace covers even the deepest and darkest of sin. Two brothers, one Father who welcomes both, no friends, 
who welcomes all, all of God's prodigal children home. Home in the arms of the God whose love, whose grace, whose forgiveness, mercy, and power knows no boundaries and who stands ready, willing, and able to receive you with joy. Friends, thanks be to God as together God's people, God's prodigal people say, Amen. Friends, what a wonderful reminder that beautiful and stirring hymn of faith is for us. That no matter who we are or where we fit in the grand scheme of God's whole creation, we are called as creatures of God, as children of God, to find our home, our hope, our peace, our rest, our joy, our very home in the arms of our God who stands watching and waiting no matter where we are. And friends, we know this is true because of our foundation in faith. That faith that gives us the ability to trust in these truths. That faith in Jesus Christ that unites us together as a people of faith. And friends, I invite us to affirm that faith in the life, in the work, and in the ministry of our Savior by sharing together in the Scots Confession, written in 1560, and again, friends, as we have throughout this season of Lent, affirm our faith with fresh new insight into what we believe about the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, I invite us to affirm our faith together. By grace alone, God chose us in His Son, Christ Jesus, before the foundation of the world was laid, and appointed Him to be our head, our brother, 
our pastor, and the great bishop of our souls. We believe our Lord Jesus offered himself a voluntary sacrifice unto his Father for us, suffered contradiction of sinners, was wounded and plagued for our transgressions, and was condemned in the presence of an earthly judge, that we should be absolved before the judgment seat of God. We believe our Lord Jesus did rise again for our justification and brought life again to us who were subject to death and bondage. Amen. Friends in Christ, one of the most powerful affirmations of our faith that I can ever think of each time we gather together for worship is that affirmation of knowing that when we come together as a people of faith in prayer, God not only hears the prayers of our hearts, but God is moved to act, to be present among God's people, to make the presence of God known in thought, word, and deed, in action that allows us to live as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And friends, if there is any gift of these promises that we worship around today, that promise of knowing that no matter where we come from, God waits for us with open arms, there is a peace and a joy. And friends, those are the gifts that we offer ourselves in prayer with today. As we come together, bowing our heads and hearts, asking, inviting God's peace and God's joy to be made known not only in our lives, but in the life of our world, as we seek to live as examples of that peace and joy in all that we say and in all that we do. Friends, as we see images of Lent once again this week, may we listen for the words, gracious and loving God, give us hope in our time, and respond in prayer together. Turn our wandering hearts to your eternal ways. Friends, let us bow together in a time of prayer. Great God of hope, when the world is confusing and frustrating, you bring light and hope. We give you thanks for lessons learned, for changes of heart, for fresh discoveries made, and for new paths followed. We pray this day for those who are confused or afraid, for those who feel anger or despair. We lift their names before you in this time of silent prayer. Gracious and loving God, give us hope in our time. Turn our wandering hearts to your eternal ways. Great God of peace, there is so much conflict, hostility, and antagonism around us and within us. Personal relationships are often tense. The world's community at odds. We pray for understanding to prevail in relationships at home, at work, at school, in our community, our country, and throughout this world. And we pray for diplomacy to end conflict and threat among your nations. We lift before you those living in conflict today in this time of silent prayer. Gracious and loving God, give us hope in our time. Turn our wandering hearts to your eternal ways. Great God of joy, we give you thanks for moments of joy and celebration in our lives, for small pleasures given and received through times of isolation. We remember those who feel left out or bitter, those who are anxious or in distress, 
We pray for those who face loss and hardship in these uncertain times, and for all who know the pain of sorrow and suffering. We name them before you, those that are on our hearts this day in this silent time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, give us hope in our time. Turn our wandering hearts to your eternal ways. Great God of community and compassion, we thank you for your steadfast presence in the face of all that brings uncertainty and worry these days. Bless our congregation and its ministry. Bless your church around this world. Inspire your people to consider renewed ministry and mission. Reawaken our love for one another and our desire to worship and serve together in the name of Jesus, our Christ. Sustain leaders who feel exhausted by the challenges they have faced and renew our stewardship with gratitude for your love. We lift the ministry of this congregation and the Church of Jesus Christ before you in this time of silent prayer. Gracious and loving God, give us hope in our time. Turn our wandering hearts to your eternal ways. Great God of grace, receive these prayers and the unspoken prayers of our hearts. Deepen our trust in you for the days ahead. For we offer ourselves as Jesus' friends and followers, praying the words he taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends in Christ, as we prepare to go out into this world, to love God by loving one another, to serve God by serving others. I repeat those themes that we lifted up both last week and this week in our worship. Friends, we are a people of worship, and we are called to worship God no matter who we are or where we may have come from because God waits for us with open arms. And friends, that is the beginning of our faith journeys. Our worship is that foundation that we build our whole lives upon. So if you are out there celebrating, praising, rejoicing that God welcomes you home with open arms, may you find a way to get involved to get involved with the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit so that the whole world may know that God's arms are wide enough for all of us and that together we may share in ministries of worship, fellowship, and mission, love, grace, and power that draws the whole world, the best of us and the ones most struggling, into the arms of a God who welcomes us home. Friends, may that be the case for each and every one of us, knowing that we do not go alone, but go uplifted by the love of God, nourished by the life of Jesus Christ, and inspired by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Thanks be to our God, as together, friends, God's people say, Amen. Praise God from
Father, Son, and Soul.